12. The night beat starts right now. You know, my answer is real simple. Don't talk to the cops. That is what one immigration attorney is warning his clients about the impact of a new law. Senate Bill 4 would allow state and local police to arrest people suspected of crossing the southern border. It's set to go into effect in nine days. Now, the attorney explains to the 19's Daniela Ibarra why he has that extreme stance. An Eagle Pass field once filled with people replaced by silver coils. The razor wire is a tool Governor Abbott credits with repelling record numbers of migrants. Now that we've taken control of this area, for the past three days, there's an average of only three people crossing illegally in this area. And on March 5th, Abbott hopes to add a new tool to his arsenal, Senate Bill 4. It makes illegally crossing the U.S.-Mexico border a misdemeanor. Under the law, Texas police have the power to arrest and deport undocumented immigrants. Every local police officer will be treated like an ICE officer and every state judge will be treated like an immigration judge. Immigration attorney Gerardo Menchaca believes it could lead to discrimination. Now, if you look like you might be an undocumented immigrant, and whatever that means, right, because they look like everybody else. Uh, if you look, happen to look like one, you might be forced to prove that you are not here without permission. Under federal law, migrants are entitled to seek asylum. Supporters of SB4 say migrants will still be able to from a Texas prison. Since SB4 was proposed, Bear County Sheriff Javier Salazar has reiterated he will not ask his deputies to make these calls and quote, does not anticipate any changes. Still, Menchaca personally feels his advice isn't too extreme. So for any crime, you're telling your clients not to go to police. Yeah, the police is no go. Court is no go. If you're owed child support for your U.S. citizen child, don't go to court. That's pretty serious. It is very serious. It is creating a permanent underclass of people who are vulnerable to crime that may not access the police. A federal judge presided over a hearing on the bill, and he hopes to have a decision made before it's set to go in effect. He does expect it to be appealed and make it all the way to the Supreme Court. In San Antonio, Daniela Ibarra, KSAT 12 News. We looked at the advice from some larger organizations like ACLU Texas, which is not telling people to avoid police, but advising them to know their rights. Now, if you want to learn more about those rights, find this story on KSAT.com. We also want you to know if you are a migrant suffering from domestic violence, even if you don't go to police, you can always call Family Violence Prevention Services, which runs the Battered Women and Children's Shelter, providing all types of services. We also have a long list of resources for you at ksat.com slash domestic violence that will not turn you away. Meanwhile, a missing girl has been found and two other wanted minors are now behind bars. The latter two accused of stealing a car and then crashing it into a San Antonio patrol vehicle. This all unfolding just a few hours ago in the inner west side. Officers got a call for that stolen car and were able to track it down. But after turning their lights and siren on, that car took off. The boy and two girls inside the car eventually ran a stop sign colliding with another SAPD patrol unit at the intersection of Delgado and Northwest 23rd Street. When police found them, they realized one of the girls had been reported missing. The driver, a young man, was charged with theft of vehicle, and it's unclear right now what charges the other girl will face, if any. All right, turning now to a look outside with live cam. Temperatures gradually falling in the low 70s right now here in the Alamo City. This, of course, follows what was a warmer than average spring-like into the weekend this afternoon. It was a beautiful day. We had plenty of sunshine, but high temperatures were able to climb their way into the 80s for a good portion of the area. If you like those spring-like temperatures, you're going to like the next 48 hours, starting with Monday. But what we're going to tack on tomorrow along with those warmer temperatures, a bit more humidity that's going to pump in through the overnight. So some areas of patchy fog likely going to greet some of us as we're stepping out for the morning drive. After that, partly cloudy into the afternoon and highs once again in the mid 80s. That's going to carry over into Tuesday as well, but then we start to see some more changes work in. Our next cold front moves through the area on Wednesday. Temperatures start to fall as early as Wednesday afternoon. Highs in the 50s and 60s expected by Thursday. So that temperature roller coaster going to be a big theme of this week. We'll talk more in depth about it coming up in just a few. Thank you, Mia. Now cyclists across San Antonio are calling for change. It's been a week since the medical examiner identified 65 year old William Mize after he was hit and killed 
riding his bike near the missions. Our 19's Avery Everett shows us how cyclists say his death sent shock waves through the community and how they're pushing bike safety across San Antonio. It's a really powerful light that can light up just like a car headlight. Veronica Salas doesn't have much room to spare on her bike. This is just an extra light. She's put safety equipment on almost every piece. So that way they can see me from further away. And even though she's been cycling in this city for more than a decade, she says she's scared. It makes you very paranoid to get out on your bike and know that this person was killed right here and he never made it home. Just one week ago, 65 year old William Mize was biking down South Presa when he was hit and killed by a driver. It's very scary. Cyclists across San Antonio say they're heartbroken. So anytime there's a fatality, there's a, a shockwave that goes through the cycling community. And now they're calling on the city. There has to be change right now. Cyclists say drivers paying attention is their biggest concern. It is drivers. It's impatient drivers. It's drivers who are on their phones. It's obviously drunk drivers. And the combination of all of those three put together is what is killing us off. They're fighting for awareness and accountability and also infrastructure changes. So we're going under a little tunnel here. Salas says she's taking alternative routes. So that way you're not crossing a big busy intersection with no protected lights. And showing them to more people. Hi ladies. It's not an end-all be-all solution. At least try to make con eye contact with people who are on the trails. But she says she's doing what she can to keep the cycling community here safe. Now, both of those bikers did acknowledge that the city is working on its bike network plan. So remember, that's a two year effort that's supposed to improve bicycle safety and infrastructure across the city, but they really say it can't come soon enough. So to understand more of that program, we already have a story up on KSAT.com right now. Avery Everett, KSAT 12 News. A new school opening this fall is making history. It's the first charter school in San Antonio dedicated to students with dyslexia. Tomorrow on GMSA at 9, we introduce you to Celebrate Dyslexia Schools, a tuition-free charter school that will be housed inside the museum. Students with dyslexia usually experience difficulties with reading, writing, and spelling. The founder of the school shared why this new program is special to her. School is so important for me because I am the parent of three dyslexic young men and have seen the struggle. I've had the experience of a son who did not have access to proper dyslexia intervention and I know what it was like as a parent to try to find it. Enrollment is open for the fall 2024 academic year for kindergarten first and second grade students. Tomorrow at 9 a.m., learn more about the teaching methods and how this will impact children in our community for years to come. To politics, Congress has until Friday to pass a funding deal and avoid a partial government shutdown. With only five days until March 1st, the deadline, federal departments and agencies that could be impacted are already updating their shutdown plans in the event a funding deal is not passed. John Sullivan looks at what it will take to avoid that partial shutdown and what Republicans and Democrats want to see in that spending deal. Time is running out for Congress to pass a spending bill and avoid a partial government shutdown. Lawmakers have until midnight Friday to pass a deal. One of the major issues under debate is $118 billion in aid for Ukraine. It's something many Democrats and Republicans are pushing for. Not only the future of Ukraine is on the line, which is extremely important, uh, but the larger battle uh, against authoritarian is authoritarianism is on the line. Ukraine will not fail under our watch. There's too much at stake here. This is not just about Ukraine. This is about freedom versus dictatorships. This is about truth versus propaganda. This will be the fourth time since September that lawmakers have been up against a funding deadline. Lawmakers keep passing short-term stopgap deals. In January, they extended some funding for veterans affairs, agriculture, and housing and urban development through March 1st. Funding for the rest of the government expires March 8th. Many Republicans don't want to pass a spending plan until they see changes in immigration and border security. You either secure the border or you get no money for the government. But now some right-wing conservative Republicans want to halt border changes. Their critics are accusing them of not taking action to help their chances of winning the White House in November. That is not good for America. They know that and they are putting Trump and Trump's personal interests ahead of the good of our country. 
I'm Jen Sullivan reporting. A day after losing her home state primary, Nikki Haley is now losing a major campaign funding. Americans for Prosperity, which is affiliated with the Koch family, is pulling the plug on campaign donations to the Haley camp. A spokesperson says while the group still supports Haley's effort in the race, it doesn't believe their funds will lead her to a path of victory. Because the Republican nomination is all but won by former President Donald Trump, the group says it will now focus their money and effort on Senate and House races. And just a few reminders now that early primary voting is underway in Texas. That early voting period will run until March 1st. Then Election Day is Tuesday, March 5th. We have more information on voting locations and a sample ballot. You can look right now on our website, ksat.com. Still ahead on the night beat, for the last decade, a local radio host has been inspiring the African-American community through music and entertainment. We introduce you to the man behind the mic. Plus, he's responsible for prosecuting officers in the law accused of crimes against the community. But attorneys for three former SAPD officers say he intentionally concealed evidence that would have set their clients free. KSAT investigates. And the president of Ukraine is pleading for help from the West as they mark two years of fighting with Russia, why the war-torn country hasn't given up hope. As the war in Ukraine enters its third year, President Volodymyr Zelensky is vowing victory against Russia, even as Russia forces advance on the battlefield. ABC's Derek Dennis reports on the Ukrainian leader's appeals to the West for more aid as a package remains stalled on Capitol Hill. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky and top security officials holding a major news conference in Kyiv as the war against Russia enters its third year. Ukraine vowing to win and for the first time disclosing Ukrainian casualty figures, claiming 31,000 Ukrainian troops have been killed since the war began, far lower than recent U.S. estimates of 70,000. The U.S. believes Russia has lost more than 300,000 killed and wounded. Zelensky adding Ukraine, which is running Running low on weapons and ammunition needs military aid from the U.S. within a month. Aid that is currently being held up by Congress. ABC's James Longman pressing Zelensky on whether that aid will arrive. Mr. President, can I ask you about aid from the U.S. Congress? Are you worried about not getting it? I think that the guys will will decide. Will make will make good decision for us. Very important. A little bit. A little bit. Hurry up for them. Yes. Have you lost faith in the U.S.? No, 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 no. They are great people. And I, worry, I count on your people. They will push everybody. So, putting on a brave face, but the war here is not going well. He still thinks, though, that aid will get through Congress. Russia, meantime, on the offensive, finally seizing the strategic eastern city of Edvika a week ago, a sign of what may lie ahead. These images show the city at the start of the war and today, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan telling ABC's Martha Raddatz it's vital for Congress to approve an aid package. This is not about a shortage of will, Martha. This is about a shortage of bullets. And if we can fill that shortage of bullets, Ukraine will stand up brave and courageous and take the fight to the Russians. Meantime, President Biden's more than 500 plus sanctions on Russian individuals and military institutions unlikely to restrain Putin, whose economy is now being fueled in part by munition production. Derek Dennis, ABC News, New York. AT&T is reimbursing customers for Thursday's massive network outage. Tens of thousands of customers dealt with error messages or no service connection. AT&T will issue a $5 credit to potentially impacted wireless customers, which it says is the average cost of a full day of service. While regional disruptions to wireless service happen occasionally, prolonged nationwide outages are rare. The Federal Communications Commission is investigating the incident. Giving back to the next generation of barbers and stylists was a main goal in today's cut-a-thon. For the fifth year, barbers and stylists in San Antonio came together to give out cuts on their own time. They didn't even get the money, though. The people in the chair instead paid in donations to help fund a future barber or beauty school student. Adelaia Figueroa is a stylist herself and owns Hair by a Blonde. <coughs> in San Antonio. She knows how tough it can be for students to get through school, so she helps coordinate this event every year as a way to give back. We all had to go to school and we realized how far this license can take us. 
Figueroa says her goal for the next year is to turn the campaign into a nonprofit that will allow the Cutathon to start supplying full barber and beauty school scholarships for more than just one student every year. Such a great idea. I love that they're doing that. Now, the Grand Champion Steer and Reserved Grand Champion Steers were the center of attention inside the St. Anthony Hotel this morning. The Steers and Cheers Brunch is marking the end of the 75th San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo. Those steers were sold yesterday for a combined, wait for it, $222,000. As the rodeo leaves town, all attention now shifts to warmer weather and fiesta that is a price tag courtney had us guess I did. earlier if today, you were watching at 5 30. news at 5 30. tiff and i were way off we'll yeah. just say that we won't say what the guesses yeah. were yeah they we were, were way really off. off but also how cool that they literally bring those into the saint anthony i know i guess i didn't <laughs> how know they that, that? Yeah. We need to find out. yeah i know like i'm so curious I to know. see how that goes but honestly last weekend in the rodeo it was nice. It was yeah. warm, but at least we didn't have to deal with any yes. rain outs or anything yes. like that. Definitely could use some more rain. I wish that we had better news for that when it comes to this week's forecast. The big story is going to be the change in temperature. So again, today we had a high temperature officially of 84 here in San Antonio, potentially a few degrees above that tomorrow and into Tuesday. So still very spring like and warmer than average over the next 48 hours. But then we see bigger changes once again move in. Don't put away the jackets just yet. We are expecting our next cold front to move in on Wednesday. I think we briefly touched the low 70s, but then after we see those winds shift in from the north, temperatures will start to fall into the 60s by Wednesday afternoon. And then check this out, potentially struggling to climb above the upper 50s on Thursday before we slowly start to warm things back up as we head into next weekend. So let's go ahead and time it all out right now across South Central Texas. Pretty much a whole lot of nothing going on late this Sunday night. We've seen a few high clouds stream in from the west today, but that's because we are still under the influence of this big blue H a high pressure system well off to our south that is still centered over Mexico. That's going to wobble around a little bit off to our south, but still really be the dominating feature here of our weather pattern into Monday and Tuesday. But by that time, Time frame eyes are then going to shift up to the northwest where we see this next area of low pressure move across the Rockies, the central plains, then eventually approach the Great Lakes region as we head into the middle of the week. This parent area of low pressure is essentially what's going to drop this next cold front into our area and behind it we will start to see some cooler air move back in as well. So we talked about high temperatures again, much cooler, especially on Thursday. Now take a look at your morning low temperatures humid tomorrow Tuesday and into Wednesday. Then after we see that cooler air move in, you're going to want to bundle up by Thursday and Friday slightly below average for this time of year with low temperatures in the mid 40s. So cooler air also drier air. You can see that here on our dew point trend over the next several days by Wednesday and Thursday. Those dew points are expected to drop lower humidity moving in so more comfortable feel. But until then, it's going to be a bit more muggy out there, especially by tomorrow morning. So winds have shifted in from the south this weekend, and we're really going to start to see a bit more of that Gulf moisture pump back into the region as we sleep tonight. So by 7 a.m. tomorrow morning, especially for those along and east of the I-35 corridor, we are expecting some areas of patchy fog, some of which could be dense in spots, especially across the coastal plains, to develop by the time we're stepping out for the morning drive. So not a bad idea, especially if you live in these areas to give yourself a little bit of extra time out the door to get to where you need to be. Temperature wise, a bit warmer than where we were this morning, starting off near 60 in the Alamo City, partly cloudy into the afternoon, 77 at noon, high temperatures in the mid 80s, maybe upper 80s along and south of Highway 90, potentially pushing that 90 degree mark across our southwestern counties. So yes, an unseasonably warm start to the Work week before we see that front move in. Windy behind the front. I mentioned earlier just a 20% chance for rain on Thursday. Coming up in the next half hour, we're going to break down why we don't have widespread rain chances in the forecast this week. And also, this weekend, we had the full snow moon. We've got some awesome KSAT Connect photos to show you too. 
I saw the moon tonight. It was so pretty. So low in the sky. It was gorgeous. Yeah, it, it was, was awesome. so nice out. Yeah, that was dinner break before I got <laughs> back inside. All right. Thank you, Mia. We'll be right back. The San Antonio Spurs month long rodeo road trip is winding down with one more game to go before they return home Thursday night. For a preview of that, here's Larry Ramirez. Unfortunately, they lost uh, tonight. I'm going to tell you what, you know those guys are ready to get back yes. home and sleep in their own bed and play right <laughs> here at home. The Spurs are trying to break a three game <laughs> losing streak tonight by beating the Jazz, a team fighting for a play in term of birth, coming up tonight on Instant Replay. High percentage shot. Inside, smothered. Yes. Victor Wimanyama had three blocks in the first quarter tonight at the Jazz and what was otherwise a disappointing opening frame for San Antonio. Wagner alum and Jazz guard Jordan Clarkson had a double-digit scoring effort. Kelvin Johnson got benched to have highlights in postgame coming up. Is there anything a part of your game that you're excited for more people to see when it comes time for the, the All-Star game? Definitely my work ethic. Um, I am a defensive player. I love defense, so how hard I work. We are now four weeks away from the first ever San Antonio Sports All-Star Game featuring some of the best senior basketball players in the greater San Antonio area. Tonight you'll hear from high school student athletes representing Brandeis, Brendan, and Harlan who are pumped and ready to go. What did you tell your team when you went into double overtime? I told my team it wasn't over and we needed to keep going and to stop celebrating because it wasn't over. It's an instant classic in girls high school hoops with Brendan knocking off Clark, the defending class 6A champs in double overtime. Brendan's star combo guard Bella Fleming has dropped a whopping 47 points to help send her team to state. And the Burning Girls basketball team also advanced to state by knocking off Fredericksburg. And do you think that Victor Wimanyama has already wrapped up the NBA Rookie of the Year award? That's our poll question tonight. You can vote on X. We'll have much more tonight on instant replay including that i'll be voting yes what else does he have to do <laughs> and that's Man, the argument out there right now okay yeah. all right all right well i'm voting yes <laughs> all right we'll be back with more night beat right after this With a computer, microphone, and internet access, one man is helping San Antonio keep its finger on the pulse of local African-American community. He is the owner and voice of WSAN Radio, an online source of music, information, and entertainment. As Katrina Weber shows us, the daily broadcast originates from a hub of history. Good morning again, everybody. Good morning. We are here live. Whether morning, noon, or night, Ronald Gordon is there, trying to spread good through the airwaves. The lifelong music lover revels in sharing his passion with the public. My dad will play music all the time. And we call it cleanup music. That was Motown. When you heard that Motown song, you had to get up. Ten years ago, he started up what is now WSAN Radio. Among the music, it also offers motivation and messages targeting the African-American community. Voting is mighty important. It's coming up March 5th, the primary voting. Gordon wasn't always this smooth of a talker. The Illinois native says he struggled with stuttering as a child. I mean, I was ashamed to talk. I got beat up. I was bullied. I was all that. Somehow, when he turned on a microphone, he found magic. He began working in his free time as a DJ at parties, then in regular radio, before going out on his own. These days, he has plenty of company, nearly 40,000 listeners. We just have fun just messing with each other because yeah. that's the family that we have and do things that we do. He also has help from people like Sharon Bell Moses, who hosts an entertainment segment. We have a bunch of fun. He's a big brother. Uh, I respect Ron very much. Uh, he's putting a lot into the community. That that includes more than his time. Gordon self-finances the entire WSAN operation. His station is non-traditional, offered strictly online and through an app, and in a non-traditional place. A former church, now the Williams Historical National Museum, currently serves as its headquarters. As Gordon and his station blaze trails in the world of radio, it's only appropriate that they do it in this space, among the images of those who've also made a lasting impression. I feel blessed that I can wake up in the morning and do something that I really like doing. Thousands of listeners seem to like it too. Katrina Weber, KSAT 12 News.
What an amazing story. Spreading good through the airwaves. Yes. So inspirational, I love that. All right, looking back outside with live cam, we're slowly starting to see those temperatures fall low 70s here in San Antonio. Of course, we were talking about a little bit earlier, of course, the unseasonably warm into the weekend that we had today. Here's a look at the Almanac data. It was unseasonably warm from start to finish. 52 was the low, well above the average of 47. 84 the high, our records 92 and 21 set back in 2008 and 1960, respectively. All of us getting into the 80s, if not the 90s. Catula 94, same out west in Del Rio. Carrizo Springs topped off at 91. And as we look ahead to our forecast highs for tomorrow across the region. We are expecting those to be very similar, if not a few degrees warmer. So again, a spring like warmer than average start to the week over the next couple of days, but then a cool down before we head into next weekend. So we'll have another full look at that coming up a little bit later in the newscast, Courtney. Thank you, Mia. See you then. Rice is among four private universities that are agreeing to settle a lawsuit alleging they violated antitrust laws in determining financial aid amounts for its students. Dartmouth, Vanderbilt and Northwestern, along with Rice, were all accused of favoring applicants of wealthier families in the financial aid process. The schools will pay $166 million as part of the agreement. Columbia, Duke, Brown, and Emory settled the same investigation last month. That agreement is now awaiting preliminary approval from a federal judge. After three mistrials in four months for fired San Antonio police officers, their attorneys have now accused the Bear County District Attorney's Office of intentional misconduct. Case that investigates tonight on The Night Beat. Their home and business sits on a tract of land approved by the city. Now one letter is leading to numerous citations. How did the city become aware of potential problems on a property with council approved zoning? Turns out that is quite a tale. Case that investigates the criminal past of the disgraced former city official behind the letter and the developer who hired him. It's apparent to all of us what's going on. KSAT's investigation, including the developer's denial of involvement, is streaming now. He's responsible for prosecuting members of law enforcement accused in high profile crimes against the community. But attorneys for three former San Antonio police officers say Daryl Harris intentionally concealed evidence that would have set their clients free. Harris defended his record to case that investigates Dylan Collier after a string of recent mistrials. Before we show you this story, just a warning, you're about to see some graphic footage. <laughs> In October, the aggravated assault trials of fired San Antonio police officers Carlos Castro and Thomas Villarreal came to a screeching halt. The pair were accused of kicking in the door of an east side home and beating a man who had fled from a traffic stop in January 2020. But a case that had already dragged on for nearly four years experienced another delay after the judge granted a mistrial. The defense telling KSAT they had learned after the trial had already started that an expert witness for the prosecution was prepared to testify Castro and Villarreal's pursuit and use of force was justified. Last month, just as the deadly conduct trial of fired SAPD officer Oscar Cruz Jr. was getting underway, the dreaded M-word reared its ugly head again. A mistrial was granted after prosecutor Daryl Harris the head of the district attorney's office civil rights division learned the miners Cruz was accused of firing his gun at in 2020 have pending cases in juvenile court. If, if it means anything, it means check the witness's criminal history before trial. There's more. Attorneys for Cruz tell KSAT one of the teens shot at admitted during an interview with investigators that he had assaulted Cruz. Their witness committed a second degree felony uh, against our against Oscar Cruz, and we didn't know that until after the jury was selected. One of the most fundamental obligations of, as a prosecutor is to ensure you're turning over discovery to the defense. Robert Almonte II served as a prosecutor at the state and federal level for 15 years before retiring from the U.S. Department of Justice in November. A, a mistrial is, is really a, a recourse of, of last resort. Um, and it, it, it doesn't usually happen. Prosecutors cited insufficient evidence late last year when dismissing the felony charge against Villarreal. 
and re-indicted Castro on a much lesser charge of misdemeanor assault. This month, Castro and Cruz filed motions asking the court to bar them from being retried, claiming the prosecution demonstrated intentional misconduct during each trial. In the case of Oscar Cruz Jr., the defense alleges intentional misconduct. In the Carlos Castro case, the defense alleges intentional misconduct. Those are very strong words to put in a motion. Very strong words. It's uh, serious allegations. Uh, I, I have no doubt that these uh, defense attorneys in those motions uh, took time and made a calculated decision. Prosecutors never want to be accused of that. Former DA Nico LaHood represents all three officers whose cases recently ended in mistrial. That's not boilerplate language. That was very calculated and intentional language because we think it's appropriate. Harris, a 21-year veteran of the DA's office, defended his track record after a recent hearing for Castro. I'm aware of my duties under the law, and I live up to them as best I, as best I know how. The capital murder trial of R.C. Curtis ended in mistrial in November 2021 after a detective testified about cell phone records neither the defense or prosecution knew about. An inspection of the case file found other evidence that had not been reviewed. Although the case fell outside the DA's Civil Rights Division, Harris was assigned to it as prosecutor. More than eight years after the murder took place, the man accused has yet to be retried. The defense usually doesn't want to request a mistrial, and certainly prosecutors don't want a mistrial. A lot of work and effort goes into it from both sides, and a mistrial doesn't usually help anybody. For Case That Investigates, I'm Dylan Collier. Harris has not been sanctioned for these alleged failures to disclose evidence. The San Antonio Police Officers Association accused District Attorney Joe Gonzalez and the DA's office of having a clear bias against officers waiting for trial. Gonzalez has pushed back, saying it's not a fair characterization of what happened. Later this spring, there will be hearings to determine if Castro and Cruz will have a second trial. Welcome back. It was a beautiful day, but now it's a beautiful night. Yes. Beautiful night with the beautiful moon. Courtney, okay, okay. she <laughs> did tell us earlier in the commercial break, she's like, look at this photo that I took of the moon on my way home for my dinner break, and it was gorgeous. Except then she was like, well, look at these <laughs> other KSAT Connect pictures I have. And like, hello, that is incredible. Hard to compare to. <laughs> Not comparable. <laughs> it was just really It was funny. beautiful It was regardless. beautiful, absolutely. So yeah, we've gotten a ton of KSAT Connect photos, and this is the full snow moon, February's full moon. This is what it look like in spring branch how about this one from bernie gorgeous this one as well just really nice definition there from chavano park and then this one was actually sent in friday night but i'm showing it again because it's awesome we had a 22 degree halo around the moon so basically the moonlight was being refracted from the ice crystals that made up that deck of high clouds that you see right there and it made for a nice halo effect around the moon so again thank you to everybody that sent in those ksat connect photos in theme with what's happening out of this world want to keep putting this on your radar the countdown is on to the total solar eclipse. We are 43 days away. Your eclipse fun fact of the day. Parts of Mexico and Canada will also experience totality. Again, this is happening on Monday, April 8th around 1.30 p.m., especially across northwestern Bear County, northwestern San Antonio, and up into the hill country. We've got that path of totality just six months after the annular eclipse that we saw back in October. So very, very exciting things on the horizon in terms of that eclipse coming up. But until then, spring like the next few days as we take a look at your weather headlines. 80 is expected again tomorrow and into Tuesday. But if that's too warm for you, never fear. We have that next cold front that's going to move in midweek, allowing more of that cooler and drier air to once again settle into south central Texas and an isolated chance of rain. That's pretty much it. And I want to go ahead and break down why that particular pattern when it comes comes to the rain chances and what we're going to be monitoring with this next little system change up again. Not a ton happening across the lower 48 right now. We are quiet across the state of Texas. Thanks to that high pressure system off to our south. A little bit of rain across the eastern half of the lower 48. Some snow as you get closer to the New England states. But take a look at what's happening already across portions of the Pacific Northwest and up into Canada. There is another disturbance, an area of low pressure that was near Alaska yesterday. This is what 
what's going to continue tracking eastward here over the next several days. By Tuesday, it is producing more snow across portions of the Rockies, even near the Pacific Northwest there as well. Then we see it approach the Great Lakes. It drops that cold front into the state of Texas, but the better dynamics for rain and even some thunderstorms well off to our northeast, closer to the Ohio River Valley, the Mississippi River Valley as well. Just a 10% chance on Wednesday. Behind that front, though, we see another disturbance move across the desert southwest. This could spark up just enough upper level energy to bring a 20% potential for an isolated shower or two on Thursday. Again, that's about it when it comes to the rainfall department. Wish it was a little bit more. Here is a look at some stats from this month. February 2024 is going to end on the drier than average side. 0.87. That's how much we have seen fall officially here in town right now. That is over half of an inch below the average for this time in the month. Thankfully, we did see though some healthier rains in January helping us out a little bit more. We'll see what we can find next week and into March in terms of a slightly more active pattern. But until then, we are quiet. Temperatures in the 60s and 70s for most, except for Kerrville. You've been able to drop into the upper 50s through the overnight. Mid to upper 50s is where we're going to start first thing tomorrow morning. Again, especially if you live along and east of the I-35 corridor, you have yourself a little bit of extra time out the door. Patchy fog expected 73 degrees at 11 a.m. High temperatures are expected to top off in the mid to upper 80s for most. Again, more of the same into Tuesday. Windy on Wednesday behind that front. Gusts upwards of 30 to 35 miles per hour. Chilly, but then we'll start to crawl back out as we head into next weekend with warmer temperatures on the way, guys. I don't know how this works, but I uploaded it to Case Connect. <laughs> and it's labeled, Mia, here's how you can find it. It's labeled Courtney's Mediocre Moon Picture. I'm so Aww. proud of you. <laughs> All right, thanks. Okay. I'm going to go look for it. Check it out. <laughs> thanks, Mia. <laughs> Now, the settings of the big movies at the weekend box office range from Jamaica to Japan. A breakdown of where the top five films stacked up this weekend, next on The Night Beat. Migration made $3 million for fifth place and a domestic total of $120 million. Madam Webb fell from second to fourth, earning another $6 million. Ordinary Angels debuted in third place with $6.5 million in ticket sales. Demon Slayer Kimetsu no Yaiba to the Hashira training opened in second place. The latest installment in the anime series made $11.6 million. Don't worry about a thing. Got every little thing. Gonna be alright. Bob Marley One Love spent a second weekend atop the chart, grossing $13.5 million for a 12 day domestic total of $71 million. In Hollywood, I'm David Daniel. San Antonio FC is two weeks away from kicking off their 2024 season, and some new faces are stepping up and leading the way. And a Judson High School wrestler received a championship parade for winning state. For a preview of what's on instant replay, here's a Larry Ramirez. And it a was, whole parade. Yes, inside the school, it was awesome to see, and this young lady was smiling from <laughs> ear to ear. A little over a week ago, Judson Rockets junior wrestler Samaria Barnett won a state championship coming up tonight on instant replay. It's very gratifying to see that the school is excited for me and that my teammates are excited for me. And then I have people that are supporting me, not just in front of me, but also behind the scenes. Samaria Barnett is the first female from Judson High School to win a state championship in wrestling. And to help her celebrate, the school gave her a championship parade through the hallways. It was awesome. You'll hear again from the state champ herself coming up tonight. With at least 11 new players on the roster, San Antonio FC is hard at work getting ready for the brand new season that starts in two weeks. A lot of the faces may have changed, but the goal remains the same, to be the best in the USL championship. We've also got the Spurs at the Jazz. Kelton Johnson was benched. Girls and Boys High School basketball and bull riding from the San Antonio Stock Show and Rodeo. All that and much more coming up right after the night beat. There's so much to see. Thank you, A Larry. lot. You got it. All right. We'll be right back.